I got to do a Royal Command performance in England this year. Very cool. You, English people are very nice, but they're the palest people on the planet. You know? <laughs> How do you get a complexion like that? You got to live in a basement, eat chalk. <laughs> and the cops don't have guns. They have whistles. I stole everything. <laughs> oh, he's going to blow a whistle. <laughs> oh, don't. I might get a ringing sensation. <laughs> Ripping off a stereo, the guy's hailing me a cab. Hey, thanks. <laughs> It's so weird, you know, because we have the same language as the English, we just use it differently. You know? Ask the guy what time to show up for the taping, he goes, oh, about half eight? Half eight? That's four, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I made fun of one of the comics on the show, he goes, are you taking the piss? No. <laughs> you can keep the piss. That's a problem in your country, people steal your piss. <laughs> How dehydrated would you have to be? You know? I got to work up in Scotland. They're big exaggerators. You know? We clone sheep. Sure you did. This sheep looks just like this sheep. <laughs> Trying to find a sheep that doesn't look like another sheep. Well, they sell that to the World Science Council. Oh, God, it's Scotland again. <laughs> oh, you've cloned sheep. Oh, I bet you have. How's that monster in the lake coming? I got to work in uh, Switzerland. It's a neutral country. How do you pull that off? Oh no, you guys fight, we'll watch. <laughs> Even worse, the World Banking episode, you guys fight, we'll hold your wallets. <laughs> Doesn't matter who wins, you only have to give one back. It's the most cosmopolitan place I've ever worked in Switzerland. It's unbelievable. The guy goes, oh, do you want to be paid in Canadian dollars and American dollars and Euros and British pounds? It's like Nazi gold if you have it, you know. <laughs> And they do. Um, I got to work up in Sweden. Oh my goodness, could these people be any better looking? They knew I was a tourist. <laughs> Trying to lose a guy, I joined a gym. They gave me a fat test. I passed. 21% body fat. To put that in perspective, a pig has 19. <laughs> You'd call me a fat pig? Actually, an insult to the pig. <laughs> that means I could work out for months just to become a fat pig. <laughs> Two months ago, you're a fat pig. I go, well, thank you, I work out, you know? <laughs> I got to travel all over, I got to work in Germany. I got married a few years ago, I married into a German family. It's a very cool culture, but a very guttural language, German. Like in English, we say butterfly. In French, papillon. In German, smetterlink! <laughs> like a little butterfly with machine guns under the wing. <laughs> In English, I love you. In French, je t'aime. In German, ich liebe dich! <laughs> German men just scare their women into bed. <laughs> They'll sleep with you, just don't talk to me anymore. <laughs> Before I married into a German family, the only thing I knew about the German culture was what I saw in those old black and white World War II films. <laughs> Not exactly the most positive portrayal. <laughs> My wife's grandfather owns a smoke shop. I like to go and order loose tobacco just to hear him say, Papas? <laughs> just a joke to see who got through high school. <laughs> uh, I do love the touring around. I got, to, uh, I got to work in the Middle East. They did seven countries in the Middle East. I ended up in Dubai, which is the liberal part of the Middle East, but it's also the hottest part of the Middle East. It was 49 degrees Celsius the day I landed, 53 degrees the day I left. If for some reason the hotel I was staying at had a workout facility that had a sauna in it. <laughs> That's a little redundant. Your entire country is a sauna. I'm a Canadian. I never just go stand in a freezer for an hour. But it's the liberal part of the Middle East, and you could tell it's the liberal part, because every country I worked in, every woman you saw on the street was covered head to toe. But in Dubai, some women were covered head to toe, but some women would show their face. So I asked the sponsor of the show, I said, well, why is that? He said, well, in the Muslim culture, a woman will cover her face, thinks a man sees her face, he might want to have sex with her, it's for modesty. I said, well, how come some are covered here and some aren't? He goes, actually, that's not up to them. Their dad makes that decision for them when they're 12. I thought, wow, that has to be an awkward moment for a 12-year-old girl having that conversation with your dad. Daddy, should I cover my face so boys won't want to have sex with me? No, you're good, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Wish it was gonna be a problem, but no. Uh, you might want to hike that skirt a bit. I, um, 
I did. I did shows in Baghdad, and then I had to go do shows in Tehran. So I'm in Iraq, and I have to fly to Iran on Iranian Airlines. So let me give you how the, this is the breakup of the flight. It was 49% of the, the passengers were uh, Iraqi, 50% were Iranian, 1% hostage. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it was. And then, I did, I did those shows and then I had to fly to do shows in Pakistan, but on my way, I had a layover in Istanbul, which was kind of neat because I had a 12 hour layover and it wasn't long enough to stay at a hotel, but I decided what I would do is I would go into town for four or five hours and then come back to the, uh, the airport. And what was neat was I'd never been to Turkey before. I'd never been to Istanbul, and, but it turns out I know a lot of people there because every uh, shop I went by, my friend, my friend. <laughs> I was like, I don't remember you at all. <laughs> I must have been really drunk in high school. <laughs> it was a, a very weird experience because anytime you go to a place like that, because like it, the three cultures collide, right? You got two continents and three cultures all colliding there. Anytime that happens anywhere in the world, the people are beautiful. Like if you go to the Dominican Republic, the people are gorgeous. You go to Lebanon where the cultures collide, the people are gorgeous. You go to Turkey, you feel handsome. I am the prettiest woman in Istanbul. I can tell you. <laughs> the nearest I can figure, 500 years ago, the Barbary pirates pulled up on shore, got off the boats, and went, okay, how about this time we just pillage? How about that? <laughs> I think that's, let's just do that. Pillaging. I, uh, I do love the uh, touring around I get to do. The only bad part of my job is I actually pay more for life insurance than you guys. And I asked my broker why they was. An entertainer is a thousand times more likely to die in a plane crash than the average person. Now granted, we fly 10 times more, but that's still way out of whack. You know? I think it's our fault, it's more likely the pilots. So you guys are in a band, huh? Do I know any of your songs? Look out for the mountain, no I don't know that one. How's that go? <laughs> That's a lot of screaming. Is it a heavy metal song? But... <laughs> I'm afraid of dying. Someone, how you'll die? Dying by fire, dying by drowning. I think the worst way to die, I gotta be dying by alcohol poisoning. Because you wake up dead <laughs> with the worst hangover ever. <laughs> then you gotta walk toward the bright light. <laughs> <laughs> See, you're an intelligent audience. You get cerebral jokes. God bless you. <laughs> I did that same joke two weeks ago in Atlanta, Georgia. It got nothing. <laughs> it got worse than nothing. An American guy was somehow mad or offended at the joke. He came backstage all mad. You can't make fun of God. <laughs> you can't make fun of God because God exists. You know how I know God exists? Because my mom was hit by a train. My mom was dead for two whole minutes. And my mom saw God. And man, your mom couldn't see a train. <laughs> God's a little more elusive. You know. No big horn or light on God that I remember. Next time your mom's walking toward the bright light, get her checked there isn't a train on the other side. How about that? I do love the touring around. I got to, uh, I got to work a few years ago out in uh, Banff. Anybody been to Banff? You see, you, you hear so much about uh, the, these places and you go there, it freaked me out. Like you pay your money to go in and then after they take your money, they give you this pamphlet this beware of bears pamphlet. I go, what's this about? I said, lots of people get mauled by bears. Can I have my money back? <laughs> oh, Simon, don't worry. Most people don't die from the bears. What do most people die from? Because most people fall off the trails. I go, how wide are these trails? I go, but great, just wide enough for me and a bear. <laughs> And they go, bears mainly only eat nuts and honey. Of course, this is the one morning I had granola for breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> and the woman, she, was, she got mad at me because she read the warning in the block right letter. Listen to this wimp. Warning, bears attack women twice as frequently as men because bears are attracted to women on their menstrual cycle. Bears are attracted to women on their menstrual cycle? <laughs> Brave bear. <laughs> Now, I don't mean that in any sort of sexist way. I truly don't, but I have lived my life, you know? I'm thinking 1,000 pound grizzly, 120 pound woman with cramps. Pretty much a fair fight, the way I call it, you know? <laughs> Matter of fact, I'll put my money on her because I know the bear can't stay mad for five days, you know? 
See, women always laugh really hard at that because they know if a guy had to take one cramp ever, the country would shut down. <laughs> Men, we pretend like we're the tough ones. We're not. Toughest guy in the world, six foot nine, 280 pounds, a solid gut crunching muscle. Gets a cold. <laughs> I'm sick. Stay home and take care of me. Woman will go to work with a bullet wound in her head, you know? Had a couple of Midol, I'm fine. We won't admit they can take more pain. We'll say, you don't know. You don't know we suffer when we go through labor pains. A guy go, yeah. Well, you ain't never been kicked in the balls. <laughs> that may be true, but nobody ever lay me on a table, put my feet in stirrups, and kick me in the balls for nine hours. <laughs> well, once, actually. <laughs> that was a great honeymoon. Anyway, um, I... I am married, my wife is gorgeous. My wife is so beautiful, people can't believe we're married. People will stop us in the street for God's like. <laughs> He's got money. You learn a whole new language when you get married, man. I learned the word compromise. I want 100 at the wedding, she won 150, so we compromised at 150. <laughs> I've had my house for eight years. I've had my furniture for eight years. I only found out after I got married, all my furniture's crap. I had a beautiful antique four-poster bed. She goes, get rid of it. I go, why? You've been with other women on that bed. What am I supposed to do with the bed? She goes, burn it. <laughs> Thinking, well, there goes the couch. <laughs> Coffee table. <laughs> kitchen counter. <laughs> that cupboard. <laughs> Well, that's a supporting wall. I think we better torch the whole place here, honey. <laughs> I do have probably the greatest uh, job in the world, and being married is, uh, is probably a great perk of it. Well, it's hard. You learn so much different stuff when you get married. Like, you can spot newlywed men because they spin the ring, huh? That's how you spot a newlywed men spend the first couple of years just spinning the ring, <laughs> desperately trying to figure out the combination. <laughs> We argued about the ring, too, because we had different tastes. I wanted something very thin and um, flesh-colored. <laughs> she wanted something that could be seen from outer space. <laughs> you got to wear a wedding band, though. It's part of the symbolism of marriage. Marriage is a symbolism, right? Both are wedding bands, some of the everlasting love. She wore diamonds, symbol of the purity of the relationship. She wore a white dress, symbol of her unbelievable sense of humor. My wife's Catholic, German Catholic, so we had to go to the Catholic marriage preparation. I didn't want to go, but we compromised. <laughs> didn't make sense to me. We want to learn how to live a long, loving, caring relationship, and who better to teach us than a celibate man that wears a dress and lives alone? <laughs> so much stuff you learn. Like, for instance, when I was a single guy, I thought I could dress myself every day. Now my wife, you're not going out in that, are you? <laughs> oh no, this is my wear it to the door outfit. <laughs> it's hard when you marry into a different culture. My wife's family's German. I'm a Canadian citizen, but I wasn't born in Canada. I was born in a place called St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica. We moved to Canada when I was three, and we came to Canada because my father's a idiot. And uh, <laughs> going, let's see, I'm in a tropical paradise. Weather's perfect always. Let's move to Canada in February. Spent the first two hours off the plane looking for my penis. But I had it when we landed, Daddy. Don't let the plane leave. See, some culture shocks hit you immediately. Other stuff hits you years later. In Jamaica, a cockroach is that big. I left when I was a little kid. When you're a little kid, a cockroach that big appears this big. So I never saw a North American cockroach. I'm like 20. I'm at my girlfriend's place. She runs out of the bathroom. Oh my God, oh my God. There's a giant cockroach in the bathroom. So now I'm thinking, <laughs> a giant, I go in like this. <laughs> I think I'm going to take one on the chin. And then it's there. I'm going, where is it? She goes, it's in the tub. So now I picture the cockroach hiding behind the shower curtain. <laughs> I rip out the curtain. Ah! I look down, it's the cutest little cockroach. <laughs> now, people are afraid of cockroaches. That's not the worst bug to be. If you're a guy, the worst bug to be has got to be the praying mantis. Because the male praying mantis, after he impregnates the female, she bites his head off. Talk about your performance pressure. No wonder they call it a praying mantis. Oh, God, I hope she likes this. I never knew my father. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, it's hard to blend a German Jamaican wedding, as you might well imagine. I've never seen people try to polka to a steel band. <laughs> but uh, coming from a, a West Indian background, marrying into a German thing, there are some culture shocks that really throw, like, like Jamaican islands, we're very poor, so our weddings are jump ups, they're very festive. Germans are very rich, successful people. They give very elaborate wedding gifts. I don't mean to brag, but we got fluffy towels. <laughs> fluffy. If you were wet, took a corner towel, touch yourself, it would suck the water right off you. Apparently. Because I'm not allowed to use these towels. <laughs> That's the thing about marrying into a German house, man. In a German house, everything has to be perfect. You marry a German girl, you don't live in a house anymore. You live in a biosphere. <laughs> Please remove your shoes and socks. <laughs> Place your feet in the disinfectant detergent. Walk down the hall, touch nothing. If you look to your left, that's our furniture museum. No one's ever sat on it, no one ever will. My wife handed me a cookie on a plate. <laughs> then she made me eat with a plate here for fear of crumb. Oh, God forbid a crumb. Like an alarm will go off. Arruga, arruga. There's a crumb on the ground. Arruga, arruga. The guys from the movie Outbreak come in in the full uniforms like. <laughs> We're going after the crumb. <laughs> Stand back, dirty person. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a Jamaican. We're way too laid back. You know? I'm on the couch watching TV. I got to take a little pee, I think. Maybe I could make that from here. You know? <laughs> I see some confusion on your face. That's a Malaysi guy joke, not a I'm a well endowed joke in case. Because <laughs> men will lie about their sexual prowess. You think we lie to you women? We lie much worse to our guy friends. Man, I had sex with her for 72 hours. <laughs> had 12 beers and went back for another week. You know? I'm happily married, folks. I have no reason to try to impress you. I'll be 100% honest. My best time ever, an hour and three minutes. And that's the night we move the clocks ahead. So really? <laughs> Who makes love for an hour, for God's sakes? <laughs> well, I cover an hour is like 10 minutes of begging and then 45 minutes of apologizing. That's how. <laughs> some reason, the women are laughing, but the men, not quite so much. See, the guys that have been married longer than me just wait a few more years. 45 minutes of begging and then nothing. <laughs> I can tell you, I can give you guys some relationship advice for the single people here. You guys want some relationship advice? Yeah. Best advice I can give the men, don't bother arguing with your wife or girlfriend. Period. Because <laughs> you never win an argument with a woman. Saturday, the moment you think you won, that's when you just lost it. Because <laughs> even if the facts are on your side, you go, fine, you're right. In a man's brain, hey, I won. <laughs> In a woman's brain, okay, now prick, now you pay. <laughs> and it's not that men aren't as smart as women. We are the sex of equal intelligence, just a woman's brain is more efficient. Women's brains hold five, six, seven different thoughts all at one time and keep that all straight. That's amazing to a man. Because be honest, gentlemen, how smart you are, a man's brain works on two channels. Channel one, can I get sex out of this? <laughs> no? Then I'm hungry. <laughs> Men get in trouble because we communicate differently. Men speak. Whereas women speak in code. <laughs> When a woman says, are you hungry? She doesn't mean, are you hungry? She means, I'm hungry. <laughs> Order something, I'm gonna eat 95% of it off your plate. When a woman says, what movie do you wanna go see? She doesn't mean, what movie do you wanna go see? She means, I've picked a movie. <laughs> Now we're gonna play Russian roulette <laughs> to see if you're an insensitive bastard. When a woman says, do you think she's pretty? She means danger, danger. <laughs> Run for your freaking life. Don't look back, there's nothing left for you here. 
don't go home, I know where you live. But relationships stay together because men and women treat the important stuff the same way, right? Like sex, right? Men and women treat sex the same way. Men and women both treat sex the same way we treat shopping. Men like to go in, get what they want, get out. <laughs> women like to browse. They could be in the store all day, they don't have to buy anything. They're just so damn happy to be there. Old girlfriend of mine said the silliest thing I ever said to her. She goes, we know what you like, but you don't know what we like. We know what excites you, but you don't excite us. Gee, like the male anatomy is something difficult to figure out. Here's a crayon, could you operate that for me? <laughs> Meanwhile, the female anatomy is like an IBM 9000, you know? We just sit there hitting keys, <laughs> hoping the printer goes off eventually, you know? And in the off chance it does go, okay, what'd I do here, all right? <laughs> you memorize what you did, you go back the next day, hit the same keys in the same order, she's changed the access code. <laughs> uh, so uh, I have three kids, because uh, I wasn't paying attention, and uh, you know. Would you agree with me, kids are way more spoiled than when we were growing up? Yeah, they get everything now, don't they? Xbox, PlayStation, Game Boy. You know what I had to play with when I was a kid? Another kid. <laughs> My dad would be, yeah, you two go out and play. You, run. <laughs> you, chase him. That's a toy. <laughs> we made our own fun growing up, right? You remember playing Red Rover? Yeah. yeah. You'd get all your friends to line up and hold hands, and you'd pick the girl you really liked, and you'd run and try to break her arm, remember? <laughs> Or what about British Bulldog? What was that? Rugby on cement without the ball. That's what that was. When we were growing up, grown-ups didn't care if we lived or died. Anybody go to a school that in the gym, they had that rope, then went 60 feet to the ceiling. Eight-year-old kids hanging on steel beams. And the gym teacher, Mr. Safety. Wow, that's high. Better put this one inch thick gray mat under there. <laughs> that way he falls, we got something to roll him up in, it's perfect. <laughs> Even your own parents didn't care if you lived or died. You ever play sports in the driveway? What would your mom say? Don't play next to the house, you'll break a window. Go play in the street. <laughs> and don't come home till the street lights are on. One year we had a blackout, I couldn't get in the house for three days. <laughs> All our toys were dangerous. Now kids have warnings. There's warnings on the pack. Can't have little pieces, little choking hazards, little precious, little choking hazards. Anybody here play marbles? There you go, Billy, a bag of choking hazards. Did you put them in your mouth? Of course you did. You had to clean them, right? What about jacks? Bite-sized road spikes, that's what that was. You got one of those caught in your throat, you got to eat the ball that came with the game. That's our... <laughs> Didn't care if we lived or died. Even our store-bought games were dangerous. Remember Operation? Your parents would bring it home, plug it into the wall, and then give you steel pliers to poke it. <laughs> Not good at it yet. Well, it's time for your bath. Bring it with you. <laughs> How many people rode down the stairs in a laundry basket? I remember I got caught. I was pulling it up the stairs. Boom, boom, boom. My mom's cooking in the kitchen. What's all that racket? Well, I'm gonna take the laundry basket top of the big stairs. It's gonna get in. Then right down real fast. Make sure your sister gets a turn. Didn't care if we lived or died. Kids now have bicycle helmets. How bad are you at this sport? Well, I would say, Mom, I'm going out to ride my bike. She'd go, roll your pants up past the knee. They're new. You can grow more skin for free. <laughs> or 
When I would fall off my bike, I would try to land on my head so I didn't get dirty. <laughs> Kids are spoiled now. You take a kid for a car ride, he's got to be in a car seat. Specially engineered, $500 bolted to the mainframe, specially angled, got a five point star harness, got to duct tape the little prick in. <laughs> What do we have safety backseat of a car? Vinyl bench, huh? Your dad would go around the corner, bish. He'd stop suddenly, bam. You're in the back bleeding and crying. What would your dad say for support? I'll come back there and give you something to cry about. That's if you got a seat. I was the youngest. And I got the ledge at the back, yeah? My head, dad hit the brakes on the highway. I'm just a projectile to the front window. Didn't care if we lived or died. Kids have entertainment systems inside the car. You don't have to take a kid to the movies. He can watch one while he's going there. What do we have for entertainment on a long car ride with your parents? I spy. <laughs> or if your family was rich, a coloring book, you know? You'd be in the back trying to color your dad's booting on a 60 miles an hour on a gravel road with one hand out the window tapping out the tunes, other hand's got a beer in it, you know? <laughs> Driving with his knee, you know? You're in the back trying to color, but you're bouncing around. <laughs> Can't even see the book because the smoke from um cigarettes coming back in your face. <laughs> she won't roll the window down because she's just had her hair done. <laughs> Didn't care if we lived or died. We had real discipline, man. We had real discipline. I, I mean, I grew up in a West Indian household. My, my father, grandfather was beaten with a cane, so he thought he'd be liberal. He beat my dad with a belt, so my dad thought he'd be liberal. He'd smack us. We don't touch our kids at all. So it took a century to get the violence out of the house, which is a wonderful thing. The only problem is father is still alive and still a West Indian man. So he comes over and sees the way I discipline my kids. He doesn't understand it at all. My son's acting up. I said, you've got a time out. And my father's like, time out? I know knockout. <laughs> This would have been a timeout for me when I was a kid. Timeout, I'm switching to the left. <laughs> but the problem when you don't discipline your kids like that, they have no fear of you. My son is late for a playoff hockey game. Hurry up, buddy, you're gonna be late. You're gonna be, no, I'm not going. And I froze. Because it just flashed back to my own childhood. And if I ever stood toe to toe with my father, and no, I'm not going. <laughs> The next words are her to be, I think he's coming too. <laughs> good morning, Mr. Cotter, I'm Dr. Smith. <laughs> the good news is you're out of the coma you've been in for six months. <laughs> the bad news is your father's here to pick you up. <laughs> we were so excited about starting a family, we had a dinner party and we, I stood up in front of all our friends and said, we're gonna start trying for our family now, we'd love your support. And everyone was so generous. Oh, you'll be the best parents, you'll love it. Then later in the kitchen, my buddies were like, let me tell you, pal, next six, seven months of your life, best time of your life when you're a guy. Because when a woman's trying to get pregnant, she wants sex all the time. Best part being the guy? She doesn't want any fancy stuff. <laughs> so you get to your business, mister. You knock me up. Thinking, here go the best six months of my life. First time, bang, pregnant. <laughs> no! <laughs> no! It's not fair! I did my job. First shot, on goal, score. They pull me for the season. <laughs> and I felt sorry for my wife having to have my kids because she's thin and beautiful and I'm a big guy. I've always been a big guy. I was nine pounds two and I was two weeks early. Yeah, I walked out. <laughs> I got the sort of body frame women have nightmares of having a kid like this because I got a huge head. Big head, big shoulders, no neck. You know? I always wanted to marry a girl with a really long neck. I figured she's got a long neck, I've got no neck, maybe the kids get some neck. <laughs> my luck, I'll end up with her neck, my head, the kid will be. <laughs> it's not easy going through life looking like this, folks. <laughs> to me, every sweater is a turtleneck. <laughs> My wife's a feminist. I had a lot of feminist leanings myself, but an old-fashioned notion growing up, it's sort of like my wife to have my name. But as soon as she said she was going to keep her own name, I didn't argue that. Isn't a single good argument in your favor? Am I property? No. Am I chattel? No. Well, why should I take your identity? 
give you 10 bucks? <laughs> The kids have my name, though. The kids come up and say, Daddy, Daddy, why does Mommy have a different last name than us? I say, well, because Mommy doesn't really love us. <laughs> she kept her own name so she can take off anytime she wants. <laughs> take a good look. She may not be here tomorrow. My wife made me go into the delivery room. You know. I didn't want to go, but we compromised. Of all the people on the planet, I'm the last person that should be in that room. I'm a comedian. <laughs> She's lying there screaming, go, I don't know why you're complaining. I've been standing for 19 hours. <laughs> you're lying there with your feet up, you lazy cow. <laughs> now, of course, she won the argument. For all the arguments she used, I couldn't believe this was the one that worked. She goes, you'll be there to share the experience. I'm a guy. I can't share the experience. I've had poos that have made me cry. I've had poos that have, I've had poos that have asked God to kill me halfway through. Kill me now, God. I can't finish the poo. Give me an epidural. I can't finish the poo. Take it out by cesarean. I'm not finishing this book. I can't picture having a nine pound, two ounce poo. If I do, there better be doctors in the room. You guys have been brilliant. I'm Simon B. Cotter. Thank you so much. Right. Simon B. Cotter, ladies and gentlemen. Simon B. Cotter.